My name is Julie Grace. I'm a policy analyst at the Badger Institute. I'm excited to introduce our guest, former State Senator John Prost today. The reason we're here though is because we at the Badger Institute, as well as the other sponsors, Right on Crime, Americans for Prosperity, and Americans for Tax Reform, as well as I think a lot of the people here, all of the people here in this building, are interested in looking at solutions that have worked in other states that have been successful, proven to be successful. Um, and fortunately, we didn't have to look too far. Um, John here, as I said, is from Michigan, and he was extremely influential in passing some of their reforms uh, revolving around criminal justice reform. Uh, they have reduced their costs. They have reduced their crime rates, reduced the number of people who go back to prison, all things that we're also interested in here in Wisconsin. Uh, so John was in the Michigan House from 2005 to 2010, and then in the Senate from 2011 to 2018. Um, John will talk for about a half hour, and then we will do Q&A. So think of questions along the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I think the love is working, right? Yeah. We good? You getting enough? Yes, Everybody's got it? Got all right, good. Thank you. Representative and other representatives, it's great to see you all here today. Members of the, of the administration, I appreciate the chance to be here today with you all, too. Um, it's especially uh, fun for me to come to the state that really kind of kick-started my love of public policy and public service. Uh, I'll flip to the slide in a moment, but obviously, um, the invitation came from the Badger Institute, Right on Crime, Americans for Prosperity, Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, and I appreciate their willingness to, to think how they can play a role in this public policy discussion, in this public policy uh, arena that really is a very, very important part of what ended up being my journey in the legislature. I did not plan for that. And by the way, I should point out, I didn't lose or get kicked out of office. It's term limited in Michigan. So I was uh, constitutionally uh, forced into a midlife crisis. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, and that is the honest truth. Uh, so I'm trying my hand at whether or not I can help continue to work in the space of good public policy. Um, and I will tell you at the outset that I had no idea that this was going to happen. Um, just a quick little experience. I was 10 years with uh, Congressman Fred Upton, uh, Republican from Michigan in the southwest corner. That's my hometown area. Uh, and then 14 years in the Michigan legislature. I uh, spent a couple years in home building and real estate development when I went through my first midlife crisis at about 27. Um, but that is also when I found my wife, again, who I actually dated in my last three weeks at Marquette. That is the significant part of this conversation. And Secretary Brennan and I were classmates at Marquette and had the opportunity to um, have more fun than any one person should have. But I know his passion for public policy and public service is the same passion that I came away from Marquette with. And I appreciate that very, very much. I had no idea about corrections other than I was appointed to the Appropriations Committee and then the Speaker of the House said, and John, we want you on corrections. And there was one reason why. Not because I was gonna be smart on corrections, but I didn't have a correctional facility in my district. And all that then the speaker wanted to do was shut down facilities. And now I don't need to worry about your pros because you are not going to have to worry about having the employees at the correctional facility be all upset because you were shutting down a facility. Uh, that was literally now go to work, John. So I did. And this was the backdrop of where we were and how challenging this space was right out of the gate, right out of the gate. As you can see from the timeline here, we had a steady increase in the prison population, which is not at all atypical uh, across the nation. I'm blocking for a couple of you. I apologize. Um, it's not atypical at all that, that we saw trend lines like this in population increases in our prisons across the nation. We've often heard of that, and I know Governor Thompson has recently made statements regarding his interest or rather looking back on his time as governor and some of the regrets that he has in the criminal justice area. That's not atypical either from some folks who are coming to criminal justice from a new perspective. And I think that as I came in, um, I was told we're gonna cut, we're gonna save money, and that's the goal. There was no talk about the constitutional responsibility that we have as legislators and as people who serve the public. And the first and foremost responsibility is what? Public safety. The criminal justice system 
as, as, a, as anybody would admit, the prison system is a part of that process and is necessary. How we engage the prison system and how we expect outcomes in the prison system and how we work with front door of the prison system and back door of the prison system, which I'll talk much more about, is a different topic, right? It's a different conversation to have. But the fact is, is that we need prisons. So let's not somehow think that prisons are going to suddenly vanish because we do criminal justice reform. No. Prisons are going to run more smoothly, have better outcomes, and have better results as it relates to community safety and public safety at the end of the day if we do things well and if we do things right. And that is not an R or a D issue. And I will show you as we go along here that there's something for everybody in this room, in this capital, and in this state as it relates to better outcomes, better results, fixed lives, safer communities, better opportunities for growth and development in our communities, et cetera. Everybody can come at this with their own political persuasion and find something good about it. I didn't know that that was going to happen in my time, but that's what ended up happening as I worked my way through this process. And it was process <coughs> in its entirety. So the backdrop was what? Huge increases. By 2007, and I leave that up there, we, six, so January of 2007, we hit 52,000 plus prisoners in the state of Michigan out of about 10 million citizens overall. That number was stretching us beyond capacity. See if this sounds familiar. Beyond capacity, not enough staff, not enough facilities, not enough beds, overcrowding of facilities, federal intervention, federal consent decrees, hundreds of millions of dollars in consent decrees being paid out of the general fund budget, which by the way, no federal dollars in here. If this sounds a little bit like Wisconsin, it is. It just was Michigan in 2007. So the governor at that time, Governor Granholm, Democrat, Republican legislature, until the last four years of her term, the last four years of her term, she had the House of Representatives and not the Senate. So Democrats in the House, when I was finishing my last four years in the minority, a Republican, right, moved to the Senate, take over majority, and Governor Snyder comes in. Governor Snyder did not come in to do criminal justice reform. I say that in part because nobody really <coughs> wants to do that except for a few people in the room that I've talked to so far, and a governor who's made it clear that criminal justice reform is part of what he would like to see happen. And in part because the story is exactly the same and it was an abysmal place to be. It was a terrible place to be. The numbers were not good at all. What are we doing in, in, in terms of crime in our peer states? It was a significant challenge. And in 2010, just a few years later than that peak that we hit in terms of total population in the prisons, we found ourselves on the wrong side of the statistical report as it related to 100,000 individuals, the crime rate was significant. We had three of the top 10 most dangerous cities in the world per capita. Three of the top 10. Detroit, Saginaw, Flint. All major manufacturing towns who were on the skids, right? And why were they on the skids? Because the auto industry collapsed at the same time that the American economy collapsed, right? We were, it was, everything was in bad shape. There was no doubt about it. So if you have that backdrop, you know that you, you, you just can't possibly get your arms around how we're going to fix the correctional system. And anybody who ever talked to me, John, congratulations, you're now chair in the Senate of the Corrections Committee. And we do a, an interesting thing in the Senate in Michigan. I also chaired the Judiciary Committee. I didn't know anything about judiciary at the time either. I was on appropriations in the House, but I, I didn't chair that committee, hadn't served on that committee. That was a fortuitous move, as I'll show you in a little while, in the way that I utilized the budget and the budget process between corrections and judiciary. But the numbers were stark. So the question that I asked my colleagues was, what are we going to do now that I'm the corrections chair? What do you guys want? Men and women in the legislature, what do you want? They said, yeah, cut corrections. Cut them. We need the money. And insert the issue that you may have. What do you want the money for? 
I mean, there's a million things we all need, right? Unlimited wants, but limited resources. Maybe it's road building. Maybe it's more per pupil funding. Maybe it's a, a property tax reform. I understand that's a topic that's being discussed. Uh, maybe it's some other insert issue here. I then found the following questions that came up. Why is it that I'm getting pushback when I actually ask the question about shutting down a facility? Which, of course, you can only do if it's public safety in mind, right? First and foremost, public safety. Secondary to that is, are we doing things appropriately within, inside the walls to try to fix those problems? Well, I found out that some legislators aren't going to like it because it might close their facility. If we achieve success in closed facilities, we might have a legislator who has one closed in their district. Well, yeah, right. That, that, it's going to happen, right? What about, uh, what, are we, what are we actually trying to solve for? Are we trying to reduce recidivism? Maybe. That's a statistical analysis that at least gives you some benchmark of success or failure. Are we simply trying to uh, decrease victimization? I hope that's a goal. I hope that's a goal for everybody, Republican or Democrat. Own that one together, right? Of course, victimization is a big problem. Victims have lifetimes of pro li a lifetime of problems afterwards sometimes. And you don't have a well-organized group in Wisconsin, as I understand, of crime victims advocacy, right? So the administration and you legislators are going to be the ones that are the advocates on that conversation, on that particular point. Are we trying to solve for crime? Well, yeah, of course we are. We're also trying to do that, but how do we get there? It's a big, big tuna to, to, try to try to pull out of the ocean, right? We weren't, weren't sure how this is going to work. And why is it hard to, to identify exactly what success looks like? If I said criminal justice reform right now, each and every one of you have your own view of what that is. Some of you may have similarities. Some of you may look at it purely from a fiscal constraint perspective. Some of you may look at it from... The juvenile justice perspective, right? I mean, that was a big topic in the last few years. Some of you may look at it as, as it, we're over-incarcerating certain populations. Some of you may look at it as a, as a uh, right on crime, let's be safe. I, I want safety and security first and foremost. Don't change anything unless you can promise me that we're more safe, right? Everybody brings their own view to what criminal justice reform looks like or sounds like or feels like. And that's the thing that is most challenging in this arena, in my mind, because everybody had their own view. And in fact, every single agency that touched the criminal justice space, the Department of Corrections, the Sheriff's Association, the Chiefs of Police, these are all Michigan-based, you insert yours here, right? Um, the Prosecuting Attorneys of Michigan, their association, everybody had a different definition for every one of these data points. So they'd publish their own data on recidivism, let's say, and the DOC would say, we are doing such a great job, we've decreased recidivism yet again. Our department is stellar. And the sheriffs would say, no, it's not, because I know how many times you're not taking folks from our facility when you're supposed to. You're actually diverting a portion of them into our facility, and you're saying that, that, that I mean, so there, there, there was no trust. There was no trust even on the data points themselves. So. With those questions, I then began to do what? Understand the facts. What really are the facts? And one of the hardest facts that I had to try to glean from the process was just benchmarking Michigan to you and Minnesota and Indiana and Ohio. We had to figure out whether or not with peer states surrounding us, are we, are we in line with our costs? Once we got through that, we then realized that we didn't have a common terminology at all, because recidivism for one group was different than another group was different than another. And that actually became one of the reform initiatives, which is to codify in law, in statute, what recidivism, recidivism really would be, so that everybody was singing from the same song sheet. Secondly, we changed the state budget, investing in specialty courts and investing in programming. We used that as the beta test, if you will, for reform ideas that later down the line, much further down the process, became statutory changes, but started instead with some of the budgetary, budgetary opportunities that helped to shift the argument more towards looking and analyzing the data, right? Not necessarily the emotion of criminal justice, but instead, hey, are specialty courts working, for example? 
That, I think, really started to change the complexion of the entire argument because we were actually now talking about data that everybody believed in, right? And, and, and you, once you all agree that, that the definition is X, it's hard to argue the data at that point if it's done appropriately. So that's really what we focused on. Um, and then finally, the reform legislation came on much later in the process as a way to then codify best practices, codify structure, codify the way that, that Michigan ought to continue to see the results that we've seen, which have been enormous and very successful. Um, we've done very well with it. Uh, but I will tell you that it, it didn't start with number three. It started in process much earlier with common definitions and trying to get to the point of understanding the data itself. Because the data itself clearly showed things that I'm going to show you in just a moment here. Sometimes you have to point out the painful obvious. Boy, was Governor Snyder pissed at me. Excuse my French. Um, the governor was very upset with me after this. That's probably a better way to put it, right? Very angry. The governor was proposing a per prisoner increase of $1,480 based upon the governor's recommended budget. At the same time, he was proposing the per pupil increase. We fund on a per pupil basis from the state level down to each of the school districts as a per pupil kid or a, a, a kid in a seat, right? That was absolute truth. What it did is it put a fine point, though, on the reality of a budget that if you don't pay attention to, no disrespect, Secretary Carr, um, but if you don't pay attention to as a public policymaker, as a legislator, because who really wants to look under the hood of corrections, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a committee you go home and get reelected on. It just isn't. It just isn't. So I had to find ways not to be incendiary, but to draw distinctive points on real data of what we were talking about. And at this point, what the argument was is the director of corrections was suggesting that we fund beds that were empty. That's why it wasn't that there wasn't a need for an increase in the budget. The need for the increase in the budget was purely because we were funding empty beds. We, we were seeing the results of some of the changes that we had made and some of the inputs that we had made. So don't be afraid to be clear about the data. I found that to be the best part of where we were able to get some unanimous consent on how we move forward with legislative changes. Every time I asked a question, it caused me to ask another question. It's kind of a Marquette Jesuit thing, I think, right? I mean, here I am in, in Wisconsin uh, with the University of Wisconsin in our shadow, right? I'm, I'm in the shadow of the University of Wisconsin. And fine institution, I went to Michigan State for grad school. So I'm all about the Big Ten and land-grant institutions. I have no problem. Um, and by the way, University of Michigan, no, I do not like University of Michigan. <laughs> Never have. Uh, and I understand that Juwan Howard was just hired to be the new uh, basketball coach. So goodbye, Beeline, in comes Juwan Howard, one of the Fab Five. Some of us are old enough in the room to know that. <laughs> All right, so what did I find out? Um, it struck me that in the conversation originally, that whole section right in there, remember what I said that legislators are like, John, that's right, go after the prisons. Cut the prisons, do anything you can. They're crooked anyway. What a mess. You know, everybody had their own view of it. And, and I thought, they're missing the idea of what this whole timeline is. And I, I came into the office. And actually, my chief of staff was a Marquette grad also. Um, it just happened like that. And I came into the office, and I said, where's that big whiteboard? I need the whiteboard. Because I was so challenged in trying to explain to people what we were doing in criminal justice reform that Everybody continued to talk about this and never ever thought about more of the timeline perspective, all right? Again, that gets back to the common definitions and the way that we try to speak about what we're doing here. Imagine if you can insert dollars here of how much we spend in the JJ system over here. For us, we're in the middle right now of debates on raise the age from 17 to 18 in Michigan. We weren't able to do it as I was leaving the legislature. Um, probation, prison, parole, right? And as I started, started to dive into those numbers, I found in Michigan that from here, probation all the way through parole is 100,000 people under supervision. I understand we're at 66,000 under supervision in the state of Wisconsin. 
Today, our prison population is, remember we hit 52. Today, our prison population is at about 38,000, 38,200. And I'll show you some of the ways that I, th that I think helped to get us to that point. But if you've got 100,000 people under supervision and everybody says fix the prisons and find ways to save money, I started asking the question, well, where are, where are our prisoners coming from? It turns out half of the commitments on an annual basis were coming from violators who either committed more crimes or failed under supervision, right? So if you knew that you had half of your input on an annual basis into our prison, already under control of, of the DOC or our counties, and we've got kind of a bifurcated system on the probation side, but on the parole side, those are all DOC. That's 100% DOC. So what are we doing to ensure on both sides of this equation that that number gets closer to the national average of only a 30% failure rate on probation and parole nationally? I mean, imagine the numbers out of, at that point, 52,000 prisoners if we were able to drop that by 20% of failures in probation and parole. So that started my process down the line, which is to recognize that there were places that we could do better in supervision. There were places that we could do better with best practices. I started to look at what other states were doing. What are we doing in the high risk probation area? How do we solve for that equation? And as it turns out, there were really best practices that exist in the nation. Hawaii Hope, if anybody's heard of that, if you've looked at it, the Hawaii Hope was Judge Alm in Hawaii who took a high-risk probation population, meaning they've committed crimes, they're going to commit more, and it's very, very likely they're going to end up in our prison system. And by the way, let's not, let's not forget that that means crimes have victims, victims have cost to society, society then is less stable and less economically viable, and communities suffer, right? I mean, so... There's still all of that, but just empirically, we had a problem uh, on the probation side that these folks are the highest risk and are likely to end up where? Right in our prison system and probably are a part of this 50%. So we instituted swift and sure sanctioning. Remember I told you that I was on the judiciary and corrections budgets? I went to the speaker and the appropriations chairman and I said, hey, I want to take money out of corrections and I want to put it in the base of judiciary. You do what? I said, yeah, I want to take it right out of corrections. And I'm going to shift a base number over to judiciary. And I want to test this pilot out. Well, how many hundreds of millions? And I said, it'll cost us $10 million. Out of a $2 billion budget in Michigan, I said, it, it's pennies off the table. We can make this thing work. And I'm going to show you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Majority Leader, we're going to be able to, sh to solve for this problem of high-risk probationers. That's just one of the examples. So what do we do? We started investing significantly. The original pilot was over a couple of years, so it's annually about $4 million now. Drug treatment courts, mental health courts, switch and share sanction courts, veterans courts. I know you have many of these, and I know that you're seeing results in many of these. This was an area that began to prove out the idea that if we're, we're doing a bit more in oversight and a bit more in evaluation and a bit more questioning of the results and seeking to have statistically valid data like in the Swift and Sure Sanction side here, where we literally took the same population and did not apply the Swift and Sure Sanction theories behind it and found that we had a statistically valid decrease of over 30%, almost 35% in the reduction in recidivism. So the failure rate was reduced significantly because of active courts. Now, that may not be easy to, to accomplish because it requires two things. An active judge who's willing to act more as a counselor and less as a gavel thrower, right? And it's a separate branch of government. You know how this goes. They don't like you telling them what to do, and you don't like them telling you what to do. Right? So we've got, a, we've got a, a challenge in that arena. But what it did is it began to show some significant benefits, as you can see here. In drug courts, a 56% reduction because of the wraparound treatment. And by the way, the costs are significantly less here for greater results than $34,000 a year in Michigan per prisoner. We then began to look at programming inside the walls. Turns out there was a significant number of people that were not prepared to go before the parole board. 
And by significant, I mean there were over 5,000 people when I first learned of the number. There were over 5,000 individuals in our prison system who had reached their earliest release date but hadn't yet to go before the parole board. So I asked why. I mean, the parole board then is our last stop in the way that we do parole. You have to satisfy the parole board with the long list of statutory requirements that the parole board has. If you meet those requirements, you shall be paroled. May, I guess is the better word, right? I mean, shall in May is a big deal. Um, you may be paroled. We found that there were over 5,000 that were not prepared because they were missing a class, court-ordered treatment, um, hadn't completed their coursework inside the walls, hadn't done the proper preparations to go before the parole board. So I asked the question, well, why is that the case? Well, it, there were excuse after excuse after excuse out of the Department of Corrections, and no disrespect again, but those excuses, once we got that number down to about 150 people on an annual basis, we then at least gave the very best opportunity for those folks to go before the parole board at earliest release date. They did, and that helped bring down that population. Remember, I told you there were 5,000 that weren't ready to go before the parole board. That was a simple, low-hanging fruit opportunity. And then we started to look at what are we doing to prepare people. In Michigan, 90% of those in prison today, of those 38,200, 90% are coming home. They're going to go back someplace in Michigan, presumably. They're going to come home. So are they prepared to be successful? Because remember, we were losing 50%, a 50% failure rate on parole. They ended up back within three years in prison, right? That was, an, that was, that was not acceptable. So we started to look at what we were doing inside the walls. And we came up with a, a fantastic program. And I give the director of corrections a great deal of credit the vocational village is a photo right here in Michigan. I don't know about you, but we do a lot of manufacturing, a lot of tool and die. I think the only difference between Michigan and Wisconsin are the logos, the color, and about 15% population difference, because we are about the same just statistically on almost everything. But if you look right here, that individual on the floor learning right now, a, a, a lathe right there, that particular bridge port is going to be utilized on a shop floor in cold water when he's released. And he's going to be the guy running that machine because he's been trained on it. I mean, that's an inside the walls reform with this, with this vocational village. Now, not everybody's eligible, eligible for the vocational village, right? So the department had to come up with really good guidelines to be able to manage a vocational village. But the whole concept was we're going to bring you into a, a, a residential style treatment inside the walls. And by that, they literally have their own wing. They're, they get up at 7 a.m. so that they can be at work at 8 o'clock, and they work until 5 o'clock. Now, mind you, it's coursework, but the idea is, is that we're going to begin to model life outside the walls early. And with the inreach of businesses into the prison system, we have the opportunity for those businesses to then attract talent and talent to be able to work. It was a unique tool. Um, the director of corrections in the budget said, we want this village, John. It's really, really important for us. I said, you know what? I need this and this. It's a little negotiation, right? I like my funding of treatment courts because I see great success in that. I said, you allow that, I'll allow this. And then she said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not for it. I'm not going to work on it. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll fund with savings that I have from another budget. I'll fund two of your vocational villages. You just have to approve my base shift over to the judiciary. So the negotiation worked out well. We've got two vocational villages. And it's low numbers today, but it's growing every, every quarter. They continue to add new people into that arena. We have the same unemployment level that you do, too. It's very, very low right now, historically low. Um, Parole certain sanctions, regional incentive program, we started to focus on how do we use the same swift and sure sanctioning on the front door, on the back door. And we found that it worked out really well because guess what? The kind of parole actions and the kind of parole supervision that you need in Milwaukee County is probably not the same as some of the other counties up north. For us in Michigan, in southeast Michigan, the Detroit area, transportation is robust. You can find public transportation easily anywhere in Southeast Michigan. Is it efficient? That's a separate question. 
but you can find it anywhere in Southeast Michigan. In my Southwest corner down over here, right? We've got four disparate systems that are not very good and not on time. Now you're really hurting the opportunity for somebody to have a job outside of the walls when they come back out. So we wanted on the parole certain sanctions and on the regional incentive program to give the parole agents more flexibility on the ground whereby they would have the ability to manage what was most needed in their population in their caseload. Previously to this, it was a one size fits all in the Department of Corrections. So the, the department is not real happy about it. In fact, I just learned that today the House accepted the governor's recommendation to remove both the parole certain sanctions and the regional incentive program. Um, it's a funding debate, so I'm hopeful that it gets back in because I think that that, that is a part of that backdoor side of accountability and verifying success. This ultimately then led to the series of reform legislation that you see. And if you recall from that timeline that I showed you, the color code fits the same, right? Juvenile justice, probation, prison, parole. These are just a few of the bipartisan bills. And it was bipartisan at this point because we had done what? We had identified common language. We had identified common statistical data. We all recognized where the problems existed and how we might be able to do something different. And at some point in that process, it became more about achieving success and a little bit less about the partisanship that happens naturally in this environment. And frankly, when you've got that adversarial position, it generally rubs its way into good public policy. I, I'm a firm believer in the way our system works. I've, I lived within that system and I tried my best to utilize it to my advantage. For the people that I served, and that's what you as legislators are doing and that's what you and the administration is trying to do too. So let that, let that natural friction happen, that's fine. But let that natural friction happen with the intent to do good public policy and make it work. And that ultimately led, not because we came out with 23 bills, but instead we proved the theory out in short and small incremental processes along the way that led to trust, common definitions, and a better understanding of just what success might look like. So in Michigan, by the way, I'm still ticked off at Governor Snyder for vetoing two of the bills. One never got out of committee. Uh, and that was a job training one. I was disappointed in that too. I shouldn't tell you about the failures, right? Um, and let me make one, one quick point on the one of the bills that was vetoed. It was related to data. And I think it may have been the, the biggest defeat of the whole package was that the data bill never passed. Excuse me, passed bipartisan support in both chambers. In fact, it was unanimous in the Senate. The data bill was vetoed by the governor because of, 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 the, of who owned the data. I suggested it went into the legislative council because the legislature has no ability to understand success or failure. This is from one legislator's view, and it may not fit to Wisconsin, but I'm telling you from, from a data perspective, I needed to trust the data just as much as the sheriffs and the prosecutors and the administration all needed to trust that the recidivism number was a valid number so that we could benchmark success or failure. If you can't measure it, how can you determine success, right? So I wanted data where, where we as legislators could do that. He vetoed it because the Michigan State Police in particular was concerned about sharing some of their data. Folks, easy enough to redact, easy enough to find uh, the pass-throughs on that data to do so. Um, I wish I could go back and fix that one, but I kind of knew the governor wasn't gonna listen to me, he was gonna listen to MSP. Uh, so 22 of 19 bills signed with bipartisan support. So what do we do again to recap? Understand the facts. We changed the state budget and then implemented reform legislation to codify the successes we were already achieving. And by that, what did we see? Again, these are since December 7th, where we are almost 52,000 compared to today. December of, of 2018 was 38.8. We're now at 38.2 and continuing to drop. Now, of course, the department came out with their budget and said, we can't close anymore. There's no way. We're, we're, we're going to go back up. OK, maybe, maybe not. Um, statistically, they're very sharp. But remember, the institution itself wants to make sure that it can manage spikes and fluctuations. 
Uh, violent crime down at that same period of time, 9%, and $1.2 in avoided or saved costs. Those are st those, as I look back today, I didn't go in expecting any of that. <coughs> I went in trying to solve the equation of why are we spending so much and can we get better results? And along the way, what did I learn? I learned that we are spending too much. We can get better results. When you close facilities, that's a $20 million benefit to the bottom line annually. And when you close facilities, because of less population, you change lives. You've taken on that timeline, if you go back over here real quick, imagine diverting early from crime. What that, what that change in cost factor is down the line for a generation. That's where we can be in Wisconsin. That's where we're starting to move towards in Michigan because looking at probation and parole and ensuring greater success in this equation here has started the process of changing lives. I went into it as a Republican caring about the budget dollars and my taxpayers. That was it. I even went into it forgetting about the fact that I had a constitutional responsibility for public safety first and foremost. And I came out on the other end of this, recognizing that not only does, is that a valid perspective, but so is the valid perspective that we're over incarcerating some people. And so is the valid perspective that there may be um, minority bias. And it is also a valid perspective that by closing facilities, it could hurt a community because the community may be standing up today on the employment base that is the Department of Corrections. But wouldn't it be great if we got to the population that was successful and we got to the population that isn't going to be successful, but we have public safety requirements. And they're there. Um, Secretary Brennan asked a great question earlier today when we, we talked a little bit. Have you achieved what you think is the right number of prisoners today in Michigan? No, because I have the innate belief that we can do better, that there can be some more decreases in the prison population because we can solve for the equation of better outcomes. Will we solve for the equation of better outcomes? If we hold accountability, and if we work hard to hold accountability, yes, I think we can. But at some point, there is a number, Secretary, that we cannot go below because you're gonna have to maintain public safety. And there are some folks, as sad as it is, that belong in prison, right. that belong in prison. And here's something that nobody knew in Michigan, because nobody pays attention to this topic. 90% are coming home. So you might as well try to make them as successful as they possibly can be when they do come home. That's only smart budgeting, right? It fits for every flavor of political spectrum that exists today in this room or any other room as it relates to it. Population down since 07 of 25%, 9% violent crime decrease and 1.2 billion saved in avoided costs. That's me in my midlife crisis trying to find a new career. And this is exactly what it looked like, just as one more little appendix to show you what that population trend line looked like. All the way along, I will point out that from this point, when I came into the legislature as chair of the budget, the expectation was in every single presentation until here, that the population was gonna increase. And look what it did. Slight increase right away, and then a steady decline from there, which has been awfully fun for me. My wife helped with this slide. Um, she's incredible with numbers. If you needed to understand a little bit more of what that is as it relates to the violent crime, et cetera, it's in the back of the packet. Then also, my estimation is, is that without rancor, without too much Frustration and finger pointing, there's a place for everybody in this room to fit in this discussion of, of how you can be successful in criminal justice reform. And I thank you for the opportunity to come to speak about what Michigan did. And I hope and pray that it's something that Wisconsin can do too because it works for everybody, no matter their political persuasion. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. What about the surrounding areas of Detroit? 
um, the more suburb areas of Detroit. Obviously, Wayne County, much like Milwaukee County, uh, and the region there is the majority, or likely, I don't know specifically the statistics, but I would, I would assume it's much like Wayne County, Detroit for us, where that's almost two thirds of the prison population is Wayne County and the surrounding area. Um, recognizing that that's the case, then what was the reaction from other legislators who didn't represent Wayne County, but represented the areas nearby, and was this a push of some of that crime out into the other areas? Um, there is a, a palpable frustration amongst those surrounding communities around Wayne County and Detroit. Now remember, this is all happening at the time that the auto industry collapses, Detroit goes into bankruptcy, the Detroit public schools have been under receivership, and we're being completely redefined and, and restructured from square one with no results in the first round of state takeover. I mean, it was abysmal problems. Um, a transportation system that, that had embezzlement all over the place, 13th payday for every employee in the, in, in the city of Detroit, um, 13th month of pay uh, in the city of Detroit by contract, and a bankrupt city. I mean, everything was wrong. So everybody around was like, well, we're, we're, we're subsidizing abysmal failure. What are we doing here? The question for those legislators that won them over was simply the fiscal question. It was simply the fiscal question, which was, do you want to continue to spend $2 billion with a 15% increase on an annual basis for as far as the eye can see, or do you want to find ways to get more money per pupil into the classroom? And it, it literally was that transactional. And once they had recognized that there was success to be found in the process, legislators started doubling down on it. By the time we got to the reform legislation portion, which was a five, six year time frame before we actually introduced the first bills or the big package, by that point, I had gained the trust. We all agreed on the numbers. We all agreed on the definitions. And we began the process of actually distributing the 23 bills that I wrote. And I went to those that were going to be the most challenging. So one of the areas that I knew I had to ensure was my vice chair, Detroit Democrat. Vice chair on the uh, Appropriations Committee. He hadn't voted for a single one of my budgets. I included everything he needed and wanted anytime he asked including funding for uh, a, a particular program that was really trusted by the community in Detroit, right? So I was doing everything that I could to bring him along, and I said, hey, Vince, do you want one of the bills? And by the way, Secretary, he was 35-year law enforcement and, and an ex-Marine. Great guy. Vince is, was just a wonderful senator and a good friend. Um, and once he saw that I was even giving him, I said, this is going to pass. The PA is going to be in your name work with me on this one. He's like, John, you're serious, right? I'm like, yeah, come on, let's do it together. And I knew that if I did that, he would be more open to looking at some of the other bills themselves. He didn't vote for all of them, but he voted for most of them, right? So I do think it was a fiscal, it was a fiscal analysis, first and foremost, for the majority of legislators, though. Because remember, it can be whatever you want it to be. Maybe it is that you want people reformed. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it is just simply dollars. OK. Well, let's figure it out. And if the crime rate's decreasing, don't we all benefit too, right? So anyway, thank you. Answer your question directly. The 1.2 billion saved or avoided was taking what every governor's budget was from 2007 forward and what the request was, all right? And then I, so extrapolating that request, we'd be at 3.2 billion in, in, in costs right now, we're at two. And we maintained a $2 billion cost structure throughout the entire time. Now, for a DOC perspective, right, we're decreasing in, in violent crime. We're decreasing the number of facilities. We're decreasing. So that static number, I would have loved to have seen it go down to about 1.8, 1.75 from the green eye shape perspective. But we kept it at $2 billion. And I still count that as a win because had we taken into account, and you remember the slide that I had, 1480 versus $100. I mean, as incendiary as that was, it was pointing out the obvious. And so I'm not going to take the governor's recommendation just dead face. Let's find a solution to the problem instead. If you do a dynamic forecast, work with me on this one. 
and this is an interactive part. How about this? Any one individual who comes into our JJ system, what other support services do you think that kid in juvenile justice system has? Where are they receiving support from the state or federal or local entities? Mental health. What else? DHS. DHS or federal things like what? Food assistance program, SNAP, right? Or SNAP, um, TANF, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're engaging the cost there. You engage the cost in the JJ system. You engage the costs of the court, because in some cases you have court action for taking kids away from moms and dads or custody, right? Then you've got foster care. Then you've got foster care that then has another foster care family. And now it's a third foster care family. And you've got the costs involved with all of that. Now imagine then the costs for that one child moved into the next phase of the probation side. And by the way, there could be serious crimes committed in this JJ side too, not just truancy, right? Then you move into the probation side. Now we're adults, whether 17 or 18. What are the costs that are incurred there? More law enforcement costs, more JJ, or excuse me, more uh, DHHS, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, imagine the all in costs for those committing crimes in our communities on that whole spectrum. And imagine at any point in time diverting somebody from that spectrum to some place of value in the community that is not costing the community quite so much. I, I don't know what that all-in number is. My guess is it's staggering. So, but that's the silo effect that we do. Why? Because one chairman, and unlike the administration who has many people working on a budget, right? One chairman in the Senate or the Joint Finance Committee isn't going to be able to do 15 budgets or 17 budgets. Plus, where you, right now they may vote on all of it, and then the legislature votes on all of it, but as a legislator, I'll tell you what, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to my higher ed budget. Why? I was so deep into my judiciary and corrections budgets, I didn't have time. I had to trust that my higher ed chair was doing her, her best work, and she was. She did a great job. So do you see my point? Imagine if we actually did have that kind of laser-like focus on the, all these costs and recognize that we silo this stuff because it's convenient for us as human beings. But in fact, that human being that's causing crime in our communities is, is an incredible cost along that entire spectrum. Just an incredible cost. Thank you. I appreciate it. And best of luck to everybody in Wisconsin. I hope it's something that, that everybody can work together to find some solutions to. And I, I do think that, that our story may give a little bit of hope in that process. So I hope that uh, I hope you can all do some good work. Best of luck. God bless. Thank you.